Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you that we have the opportunity to be here. Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come to church for tradition or ritualistic sake. God, we don't come for entertainment. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ who's the senior leader of this house and of this church. So Lord, in the name of Jesus... We ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher tonight, would be our counselor, would show us things in the Word of God, would reveal to us things in our lives that we might uh, uh, be strengthened and, and empowered to go and to be your church, to, be, to show the blessings of God to the world. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given to us. Lord, we don't ever think of ourselves here at the Rock as better than anybody else, but rather we are brothers and sisters in, the, in Christ working together in your kingdom for your glory. So, Father, we thank you for all the churches across the Inland Empire that are celebrating and teaching and hearing the, the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ tonight and this weekend. Lord, we thank you that, that you would bless them, our, our denominational brothers and sisters. Lord, all the local churches on the Inland Empire. Lord, we thank you that we are all working together for your kingdom, for your glory, Lord. So to you be the praise, Lord. To you be the honor. To you be the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, as you're being seated, if you've got your Bibles, go to me the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew. This is something that I was just reading through. In, in a time of study, just kind of going with God, and, and it just jumped out at me. Have you ever had, have you ever read one of those scriptures that it's, it's just, it's, it's heavy? I'll just say it like that. I was going to say deep, but let's just, let's just tell it like it is. You ever read one of those scriptures where it's just like heavy? You read it, and you're kind of like, whoa. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Any, any, you ever read one of those? You're like, man. Well, today we're going to look at Matthew, Matthew in the 11th chapter. This is, a, this is one of those scriptures, and, and, and it's a challenge to you and I. It's a challenge to you and I of what Jesus is saying. Now, he's, we're going to read a statement that Jesus says. We're going to look at some things that Jesus said. And, and really what this is, is uh, it's, it's, it's more like a shot across the bow. You know what I mean when I say shot across the bow? Uh, in, in olden times when they had cannons and, and, and ships would come across and there was oftentimes before a ship would overtake, usually if it was like a, 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 a Navy ship coming against a privateer ship, oftentimes they would shoot a cannonball over the bow of the ship to say, hey, listen, we've got our cannons loaded. We're ready to go. You need to slow down or you need to stop and we're going we're gonna to come and we're going to do something. All right? We're going to board or we're going to check you out or whatever it might be. It was a warning shot. This this statement that Jesus makes is really a warning shot. And as I was reading through this, uh, it was really, to me, it just jumped out at me as a warning shot to myself. And even not just myself, but the church. And, and going a step further, you'll see this. I, I really believe that we as a, as a nation, this is really a warning shot or a shot across the bow to, to you and I as a nation that I truly believe has been blessed by the hand of God. And so looking at Matthew, the, the 11th chapter, the title, as I, as I asked Elijah if he, if he looked at my notes, I was like, man, the, the title of that song is called Moving Forward, and the title of my message is called Moving Forward. So I was like, wow, God, you Holy Spirit, you're amazing. So you should have just lied and said no. But anyways, no. If you lie, you fry, right? Matthew, the 11th chapter, Jesus is speaking. And, and very interesting, very amazing statement that he's, he's talking about. And, and, and here he's giving a real shot across the bow. And it says in verse number 20, starting in Matthew, the 11th chapter, verse number 20. It says about Jesus, it says, And then he began to rebuke the cities which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. So this is telling us what Jesus is about to say. So let's just look at this for just a moment, what's being said. It's, the Bible says that what's about to follow is a rebuke or a correction or a statement that Jesus is saying, you guys need to listen up, perk up, because these words are pertinent for you, because what I'm about to say is a matter of life and death. And truly for you and I as Christians, this is a statement. And I don't want this to be a negative. This isn't a downer message. So let's not be down. Let's not say, oh man, I should have I gotten to that other place today. Because really what this is, is an encouragement for you and I. Because we are so blessed by God that we get to see these things. You know, they, they make the statement, hindsight is 2020. Does anybody ever, have, have anybody ever lived that where they say, you say, what does that mean? Hindsight is perfect vision where when you look back, you see the situation completely clear. 
But when you're in the mix, when you're going through it, you have no clue. It's blurry, it's fuzzy, and you don't know what to do. But when the, when the situation is resolved, hindsight is 20-20. You see, you and I are living in a time of hindsight with the words of Jesus. We get to look back and see these statements and the reactions of them, and we get to learn from them. So that's the blessing that you and I have. So the Bible tells us that he began to rebuke the cities that he had done his most miracles in because they did not repent. Now let's talk about this for a moment, that word repent. The word repent doesn't just mean, oh, okay, God, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, you're right, I'm wrong. Repentance is something completely different. Re repentance is an action word. Repentance means I'm going to take what I've heard. I'm going to take my life and I'm going to shift from the direction that I'm going and I'm going to turn 180 degrees from the way that I was going and I'm going to start heading in the other direction or the direction towards God, the direction leading towards God. You see, so everything Jesus had done had been leading them up to this moment. He didn't rebuke them as he walked into the city for the very first time. This wasn't Jesus coming into these three cities that he's about to talk about saying, hey, listen, this is my first stop on my itinerary. I've never been here before, and I'm going to rebuke you. What Jesus started to do is he started to show up. His presence was made. He began to manifest. He began to show the goodness of God, the power of God. He began to work with them and in their hearts, little by little by little, showing them. And in the, in the process, there was never a change being saw or seen in these cities. Now we find ourselves in Matthew, the 11th chapter. So Jesus is rebuking and he says uh, in verse number 21, Woe to you. Woe to you. Now, that's definitely uh, uh, not a good statement. We don't often talk like that. Oh, woe to me. You know, I mean, if, you ever, if you've ever stubbed your toe or anything like that, I was running the other day chasing my little boy. I thought I broke three of my toes. It was amazing. I was running barefoot in the house, and I just, I don't know, ran right into a wall. I, don't ask how. But, you know, I didn't jam my toes and say, oh, woe to me. We don't talk like that very much. But when, when you say, when, when you hear woe to or a oh, woe is, that, mean, that means, hey, listen, some judgment's coming your way. All right? That means something's coming your way and it's not good. All right? Woe is not one of those like, woe to me. No, it's not like that, okay? So just, just let we clear the air on that, okay? So Jesus says, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you, had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Okay, what did, what did Jesus just say? Let's talk about this. So Jesus says to, you, says to these two cities, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. If, you, if, if what had been done to you, if what had been said in your city, in your vicinity, had been said in the cities of Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. There's, a real, there's some interesting similarities between the two cities that had previously faced judgment. We read about them in, in the prophets Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were two coastal cities on the Mediterranean. Both of them were very prosperous. They were meccas uh, for trade. They were, uh, uh, they, had, they, they, were, they were great supply cities. And in doing so, they were very well known around the world or, or the world as, as, as it was in that time. They were uh, uh, hubs of business and of industry. But yet in, in their, in their self-reliance and looking at how good they were compared to God, God removed his hand from them and they fell and they were they were overrun. Now the similarity is, is these two cities, Chorazin and Beth Bethsaida, are two coastal cities, not on the Mediterranean, but on the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus' ministry was focused around. And so here, there's similarities. These are two cities. Uh, and, and for example, in Beth Bethsaida, there, there was a pool there. And we see many, uh, 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 many miracles of, of lame being healed and Jesus speaking. And he says, if the words had been said to you in these cities that were already destroyed, they would have turned. He's giving a comparison statement. He's likening them to other cities. So the message for you and I, there are things that we can learn from if we look in history, if we look back on certain societies, if we look back on certain rulers or certain kingdoms where they succeeded, but yet they walked away or they turned away from the heart of God. And in doing so, we see that their kingdoms or these countries or these nations literally crumbled from the inside out because God had removed himself from them because they had walked away from God. 
And Jesus is giving them such a statement. He's telling these two cities that, that they are so wrong that, that the other cities in the past would have repented had they heard. He's giving them a conditioning statement. Long ago in sackcloth and ashes, that means immediate repentance. That means, that means a sackcloth and ashes means that I'm going to take away my, my glory. I'm going to remove these clothes and I'm going to wear humbling clothes and I'm going to cover myself in ash and I'm going to lower myself to the position of dirt of the ground to humble myself before God. Verse number 22, Jesus goes on. And he says, but I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Whoa. See, this is an amazing statement because Jesus is talking to people who already know what happened to these two cities, Tyre and Sidon. They were already run down. They were already destroyed once before. So they had seen these before. They had already seen what had happened. And he says, it will be more tolerable for them than for you. Because, you see, they didn't have the words of Jesus. They had the words of the prophets. They had the words of the Old Testament. They had the, the looking forward, the shadows and the types. But now, Bethsaida and Chorazon have the words of the living God, God Most High. They see what he has done, and they are still ignoring his words. Verse number 23, he goes on and says, And for you, Capernaum, who, ex who are exalted to heaven will be brought down to Hades or to hell. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. What a statement Jesus is saying. And he's saying, this is a city that is well known. This is a city that has seen amazing things. This is the city, if you recall, in Jesus' ministry where he was witnessing or he was teaching and the house was so crowded that nobody could get in and four men took their paralytic friend to the roof, ripped a hole in the roof and lowered him into the house and Jesus healed that man in front of the crowd. This is that city. This is where Jesus literally resided in his ministry. He had traveled around, but he had spent time residing here in this city. And he says, you are lifted to heaven. You are a great city held high on a pedestal, but you will be brought down to hell because of what has been done in your city and the lack of changing. And then he goes on and he makes an amazing statement. He says, Sodom. We know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the, the hellfire and brimstone message of, of, of fire coming from the sky as God destroys these evil cities, as Abraham pleads with God for the righteous and, 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 his, and his nephew Lot is rescued. Jesus says Sodom, the most famous of sinful cities in the Bible, will remain until this day if they had heard the message that you had heard. Think about that for a moment. Sodom, is, it was a city. It was wrapped up in self. It was a city. If you look, about it, look at uh, the, the encounter of, of, of Lot as, as they're going to rescue, as the angels of the Lord come to Lot to pull him out of the city, we see the firsthand, the, the nature of this city as they come. And this was a city that was, that was striving for itself, that everything was looking, everybody in the, ha in the city, the inhabitants of the city, was only looking towards their own self-pleasure, their own self-fulfillment. Nobody was looking for, for the next person or nobody was looking out or looking towards God. And because of that, they were destroyed. But Jesus says they would have remained had they heard the words of God. Their hearts were more receptive than this city. Verse number 24 goes on. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in that day of judgment than for you. Now that's an amazing statement, even more so than Tyre and Sidon. Why? Because we know exactly what happened to Sodom. Fire from the sky destroyed that city. And Jesus says it will be more tolerable for them than for you. What a statement. What a shot across the bow. These were the cities that Jesus had done great miracles in. These were the cities that Jesus hadn't just come and passed through. But he dwelt in, he resided in, he spent time in. They heard the word of God over and over and over. They saw the miracles of Jesus Christ, the signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit confirming the word of God. And yet in spite of that, they remained the same in their lives. That's the message. They remain the same. See, repentance says, I'm going I'm to turn from the way I was going and go this way. 
But if you don't repent, you continue in the path that you're heading. So Jesus says, you've heard, you have seen, and you did not change. You did not adjust course. And because of that, woe to you. Now, when I was reading that, that was really a a shot across the bow because looking at that, what does that say to you and I as members of the church when we hear, when we see the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we see the goodness of God in our lives and yet we forget to to repent or yet we don't change course in our lives? Let Let me take it a step further. What does that mean for the church where we have seen the goodness of God, God sustaining his his church for the the thousands of years, and yet we still continue in the direction seeking after ourselves like Sodom? What does this say, church, for our nation that was formed under God with men who believed that they would go to a new land so that they could freely seek, so that they could freely worship God. And it's evident in this land that we live in an area, in a nation, blessed by Almighty God because of our foundation. But if we walk away from what we were formed with, what does that say for America? And in reading this, my heart broke. For my nation, my heart broke for my country, my heart broke for my church, my heart broke for myself. Because God is sending a shot across the bow. He says, listen, you have seen, you have heard, you have experienced the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And yet, you continue down that path. If he says this about cities, what does he say now about you and I? But you know what? Remember I said this isn't a doom and gloom. This isn't a heartbreak message. This is a message that says it's an encouragement to you and I that this doesn't have to be our direction. This doesn't have to be our outcome because hindsight is 2020. And while we have breath in our lungs and a beat in our heart, we can do something about it. This country, the church, not just the, not the rock, the stat, status of the church, it's not too far gone. Listen, church, it's not too far. You say, man, the United States of America, the way that the politicians, the way that they've run it, the way that things are going, it is out there. It's hopeless. It's doomed. But let me tell you something. It is not over yet, but it's going to take the church, you and I, to hear the cannonball cross the bow of the ship and to say it's time for us to change course. The word of God, the signs, wonders, and miracles of God for you and I are never, 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 listen church, never to be taken lightly. Never. One of the worst things we could do in our lives is to begin to treat God as common. One of the worst things we can do is begin to treat church to treat the word of God, to treat uh, hearing a testimony of somebody being healed or, or somebody's life being restored as common. Because what that does is it demystifies, it brings God from the level that he deserves to be, that he will be regardless of how we see him, and he brings him down to our level. And God says he will not tolerate that. And when we get a grasp of the things of God, I tell you what, things will change. I, I, I love the fact that one of the class that I teach in our Bible college is, is church history. And there's so much that we can learn from the history. We, we teach it in eight weeks, and so in, in the short eight-week process, it's, it's hard. And I, and I tell my class, if you've ever been in my church history class, you, you know the statement that I'm about to say. I say, it's, it's not about names and dates. Because if we memorize names and dates, we might lose the message. It's it's about what we can take from history and apply it to our lives. And one of the things that we saw in in the process of church history is that the early church, before Christianity became popular, before Christianity became the state religion of Rome, before it was adopted, it was persecuted heavily. And in that persecution... We might think that the church decreased, that the church as it was, as they met underground, as they met in sewers, as they met in grave sites, as they met where nobody else would go, you would think maybe, okay, the church survived, it sustained, but the reality is history shows us that the church thrived because they weren't afraid 
because they had heard this shot across the bow, that they had realized that they had seen the word of God in action in their lives and they could no longer go back to the lives that they had before. And now we live a life where we think of persecution as the person at work thinking that we're weird. We live a life of the persecution that we face in this blessed country of ours as people saying, uh, as your neighbors might go into the house when you come out because you're the Christian and they don't want to hear it. When the church of the first century thought of persecution as being burned at the stake, being fed to animals to watch their children taken from their hands and watch and listen to the crowds of Romans scream and enjoyment as their children were fed to live animals for spectacle. But that's because they had heard the shot across the bow. Now, I'm not criticizing and I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay who we are, but what I am saying is that America, Americans... I like to say it like this, Americans, we are blessed. We are blessed. We are so blessed. We don't even know how blessed we are. But in my own life, I've had the privilege. I wouldn't call them privileges while I was living them, but I've had the privilege of going to uh, Africa. I've had the privilege of being in Peru. I've had the privilege. Mom and dad, I remember, took my, my sister and I when we were kids. They took us to Disneyland. We stayed the night in the Disneyland Hotel back before there was California and all that stuff. I mean, it was a big deal to stay in Disneyland. And it was like we were in heaven. I mean, it was just amazing. They took us to Disneyland. And then we got in the car after Disneyland Hotel and drove to an orphanage in Mexico where they had no power, where they had nothing, and we lived with children that had nothing for a week to experience how blessed we were. I remember in a missions trip in Peru, we would go, we were in the, on, the, on the east side of the Andes, in the Amazon jungle, in villages. These villages didn't have electricity oftentimes, or, or, or we were just out there and we were ministering, and I remember we would go into the city streets. And we would ask them. They would have cataracts or they would have tumors. And we would tell them, Jesus Christ can heal you. Do you want to be healed? Yes. Do you believe that he can heal you? Yes. And we would literally put our hand on that and we would speak to it. And as our hand came off, it would be gone. Like that. No joke. True story. Why? Because they don't have the skepticism that we have. Because they don't say, well... I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a try. Well, well, let's see. This happened to my friend, or the doctor said this. They just simply said, you say somebody can heal me? Let's do it. I, you got it. And they believed. And because of their belief, signs and wonders and miracles happened right there before our eyes. It's not too late for us. It's not over for America. It's not too late for us, but we have got to, like Jesus said, hear the words of God and change direction, change course in our lives. And in doing so, we will see revival in our nation. We will see revival in San Bernardino. We will see revival across the world. So today, let's talk about moving forward. Moving forward, some lessons that as I was studying, the Lord had shown me some things in my own life to look at, to remember, to apply. So looking at moving forward, we'll four things today we'll look at today. Moving forward, number one is to allow God's presence to shine. Now I have in parentheses on my notes, and if you're taking notes, write in parentheses after that statement, in your life, in my life. Now, I made this statement, I, I, I wordsmith this with, with careful thought because the statement there is allow God's presence to shine. Because you see, what it boils down to for you and I is it's always a choice in what we do with the presence of God on the inside of us. We have a choice in our lives to allow God's goodness to reflect or to hide it. Thinking back of the, the, the cities, Jesus had, had named off cities that, that had heard, but that, that were destroyed in history because they turned from God. Remember the story of Jonah. Jonah, God calls him to Nineveh, and Jonah says, I don't want to go to Nineveh. So Jonah jumps, jumps on a boat, heads the opposite direction. You know the story. Storm comes up, because you've seen the VeggieTales movie. Storm comes up. 
Whale swallows Jonah. Whale spits Jonah out three days later on the ocean. Miracle, right? Jonah says, okay, God, I'll go to Nineveh. Jonah goes to Nineveh, preaches the message. Everybody tears their clothes, freaks out. And, 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 and Jonah goes and sits on a hill. And he's thinking, man, they heard the word of God, but they're not going to change. And so he sits on a hill and he's waiting. He, he's excited. Jonah thinks in his mind, I'm going to be the prophet that will be recorded as the one that talked to Nineveh. They didn't change. And God rained down fire like Sodom and Gomorrah. So there Jonah sits on a hill. But something happens in Nineveh. They heard the word of God and they changed. They made a choice. They said, no, we will stop living this way. If you've seen the Veggie Tales, they'll stop slapping each other with fish. It's a choice that we make. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, in verse number 14 of Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus says this amazing statement. He says, you, you, who is you? Me. So I'll say, who is you? Okay, that's total bad English. That was total bad English. Too. Okay, anyways. <laughs> who is you? Oh my gosh. Okay, okay. Let's try it again. Who is you? Me. I, you, we are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse number 15 goes on and he says, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. He says, you don't put a lamp, you don't light a lantern. We don't, have, we don't light lamps with wicks anymore. You don't turn a light on and throw a blanket over it. It's a fire hazard. Not only that, it's a waste of energy. Not only that, the room doesn't light up. You don't light a lamp and hide it under the basket. Look what he goes on and he says, but on a lampstand it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16, let your light shine. Let, see that word, let? That's a statement that says to you and I, it's a choice, it's a decision that we make to allow, to let our light shine before all men, that they may see good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It's a decision each and every day we have to make that we are going to reflect the glory of God. I remember I was playing ice hockey in a recreational league, and my brother-in-law had got me back into playing ice hockey, and, and everybody on the team, uh, I mean, it was, it was one of those things where I was the only Christian on the team, and in the, the, the locker room conversations, I just prayed in the Spirit to myself and just tried to tune it all out. But after a couple of years playing with these guys, I had garnered a reputation with them. They called me Rev because they knew that I was a, a college group pastor. They knew that I was, they, they knew that, like, they started to, like, you know, sneak the beer in the locker room underneath, and then when I walked out to go to the bathroom, then they, you know, they, I, had, I had this reputation just because they would offer and I would say no, or they would never hear me curse, or they would never hear me talk in the conversations that they were, that I played a, a, a sportsman's game. But then I remember there was a game that we were playing, and there was a guy that, that, that was, he was the counter position to my position, and he was, he was playing cheap. He was taking cheap shots. He was hitting me in the, in the small of my back. He was trying to take out my skates. He was trying to, to get me down all throughout the game. And so I remember there was this period, uh, this time in this game where him and I were skating for the puck in the corner, and I was going as fast as I could, and he put his stick under my skate and pulled which means my head went first, my feet went last into the boards. Not fun when you're skating at full speed on ice. Cold plus impact means hurt. All right, so there I'm in the boards, my head is all crunched up, and this guy, I don't know, just didn't get the memo that I fell, and he fell on top of me. So cold, impact, hurt, then a dude on top of me, 200-pound guy, lands on me. All right, so I get up, I hear the whistle blow, I'm like, good. Ref saw it right on. So, you know, in hockey, the referee, they, they put their hand up. That means that there's a penalty being called. So I'm like, right on, man. Get that guy. Get that guy. So I'm skating back, not even paying attention. The ref's following me with his hand up. He's following me. Usually the ref is waiting for you to look at him. And I turn around, and he sees me, and he's pointing at me. And he goes, tripping. And I, I'm like, no, 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 no. Surely you have this wrong. He put his stick under my skate. No, no, no. You fell, and you tripped him. He was going for the puck. You have a, a penalty. Okay? We have a choice. And you say, where are you going with this? Because every day is a choice. And Pastor Luke, after garnering a, a, a reputation of being called Rev, had made a choice to put my lamp under a basket. 
all right? And the college or high school words started coming out, and, and I started, are you? I mean, and the whole bench on my team, it, it, it was, you would have thought there was a fight because the whole bench was like up over the bench. Hey, hey, Rev, shut up, shut up, stop. That's not you. We have a choice whether we can reflect God's goodness or we cannot. And in that moment of anger, that moment of rage, that moment of, of heated passion, I had made a choice. It was the wrong one. And it showed me, based on the reaction of my teammates, that I had choices to make. And sure, I felt little. Sure, I felt dumb. But nothing is better than starting the moment after saying, hey, guys, I'm sorry. I made the wrong choice. We've got to start making choices. I love what Philippians says. I'll just put it up on the overhead. It says, do all things without complaining and disputing. Hello. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Why? Verse 15. That you may become blameless, harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That you might be called Rev on a secular hockey team. And you shine as lights in the world. We shine, but it's a choice. We have to allow that light to shine by making a choice each and every day. Every action, every word that we speak will either mask or display God's goodness for the world to see. So let's make decisions to not become like those cities and mask God's goodness, but rather shine it in as, a, as an indication of the change of our direction. We're talking about moving forward. Number two, moving forward, unselfishly love God. We have got to unselfishly love God. Now that is such a contradictory statement. Once again, I really thought on this one. Unselfishly, because if you've, if you've ever read 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, the love chapter, we know that love is not self-seeking. It does not seek its own. It's not prideful. It's not boastful. So how can love, in its essence, in any form or fashion, have selfishness in it? Let's talk about that. To unselfishly love God. What happens to you and I? What happens to us as we get into this position? I talked about this last week on Sunday morning, if you, if you heard it, uh, an amazing statement. How we view God determines our outcome in life. And we begin to see God as this, as this deity or this being in the sky that is there for our beckoning need. And we begin to see God as this need answering device type thing where we only go to God when I need. God, I need. God, I need. God, I need. God, I have a need. God, I have a need. God, I have a need. God, I need. I need you. I need. I need. I need. I need. God, I, 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 me, me, me. God, I, I. You see what I'm saying? Is our focus is on our own well-being. And love, when we focus on ourselves, is a selfish love. Selfish love is only loving when our own benefit is at hand. So the question is, how can we unselfishly love God? The answer to that question is, is we love God, not just when our own benefit is at hand, but when it's not. Now that's an oh my statement, not an amen statement. I totally, I'm there with you. Don't say amen. Because you're feeling it, I'm feeling it too. Look what the, the Bible says in Psalms, the 31st chapter. The Bible says, love the Lord, all you his saints, verse number 23. For the Lord preserves the faithful. Pastor Jim talked about that today. It's faithful. It's, it's easy to be faithful when there's no opposition. And he used the example of Pastor Deborah. Well, I won't use that example. I'll use Stacy. It's easy to be faithful to Stacy when I love, when things, are, when, when things are good, when there's flowers and sunshine and rainbows, but when you take the pacifier from your 18-month-old daughter and you haven't slept in six days and, and you have a three-year-old that wants to terrorize the house and you've got this going on and you've got that going on, it gets a little tougher to love. That's when love really sets in. He preserves the faithful in the good and the bad. That's faithful. And fully repays the, proud, repays the proud person. Pastor Dan talked about this on Wednesday. The children of Israel, Israel in Exodus 17 chapter. As they're going through the desert, three days in the desert after being uh, uh, led miraculously through the Red Sea, after being led by the, the presence of God, they come to a place three days in the desert without water. Now they're at a well and, the, and this, this oasis, the water is bitter. They can't drink it. 
And they begin to cry out and test God. Oh God, you let us here to the desert to die. We would have been better off as slaves in Egypt. We, would have, we should have just stayed. Oh, we're, we should stone Moses. Who is this guy that we listen to? You see, they were conditioned to only loving God when it was beneficial to them. And I believe that God had miraculously brought them to a bitter well to see the condition and reveal the condition of their hearts. Because if they were to enter into the promised land, we talked about this last week, God doesn't tempt. If they come in with the wrong heart into the promised land, what are they going to do with the promised land? He who is faithful in the little will be faithful, will be faithful with the more, right? You say, Pastor, look, we're not even talking about finances, but we are. Okay, anyways. Because God tested them. And because of that, they tested after God. They cried after God. Who is this? Is God for us? And so they named the well. They named the well Massa and Meribah, which literally means contention and temptation. God provides water. And they say, well, God, thank you for providing water. We're going to name this oasis contention and, and temptation. Not, re not rest restoration, not salvation, not any of the other Asians. Contention and temptation. Because they were conditioned to only loving God when it was beneficial to them. We can never do that. We can never go before God and say, God, I, 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 me, me, me. Psalms 95th chapter, speaking of this particular situation, in Psalms the 95th chapter, I have it up on the overhead. The psalmist is saying, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. As in the day of trial, if you look at that word trial, in certain Bibles, and certain commentaries, you'll see that word is this well right here. This is the day of trial, coming to the well and testing God. We would have been better off without you. We would have been better off as slaves. God, we were perfectly happy crying out to you for a Savior than being saved. Because it was easier to be a slave and want a savior than it was to be redeemed and now work for God. Because they were loving selfishly. The, 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 the well literally meant, is the Lord with us or not? Don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial. Is the Lord with me or not? When, you t when your fathers tested me, they tried me. Though they saw my work, the psalmist says. The thing is, is you and I have got to love God he, when he is ever present in our life. God, thank you for providing my need. I'm not saying we don't go to God for our needs, but what I'm saying is that we don't only go to God for our needs. My little three-year-old, he's obsessed with money. He found out about that money buys things. It's awesome because now bribery is so effective. <laughs> Toys everywhere. Hey, you want to earn some money? Yeah. But you know, when he comes to me and he's screaming, he's flopping on the ground and he's crying, I want money, I want money, I want money. Do I want to give him money? Absolutely not. No way. As a matter of fact, the other day, I pulled his piggy bank out while he was throwing a thing and I dumped his money back into my piggy bank. I said, you're going to act like that, I'm going to take your money. But when my little boy comes up beside me and he doesn't ask for anything and he hugs me, Walk comes up on my lap and straddles my lap and gives me a big hug. And he says, Dad, I just love you so much. You know what I do? I go get my money bank and I pour money into his. Why? I'm not, because that's when I want to bless him. And God's saying, when you come to me kicking and screaming and crying on the ground, and that's the only time our, we have a conversation, we've got problems in our relationship. God says, I want you to love me when I'm blessing you and I'm open in the shadows. And I want you to love me when you don't even think I'm there. Now, I just made a bold statement in the middle of that clap, so let me say it again so you heard it. God says, I want you to love me when you don't even think I'm there. Yeah. Amen. Because there's times when God will allow us to live life and experience. We see this in the Bible as evidence. John the Baptist asked Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? John the Baptist felt like God had left him, had deserted him, that his whole life's mission was to proclaim Jesus, and now he's questioning that. Jesus on the cross said, God, why have you forsaken me? But even still, didn't come down off that cross, carry through because he loved God. They loved God enough to carry through when God provided and when God allowed them to live life in its pains. Because God 
He's a God that provides, and he has the outlook for us. But we've got to learn to not love God selfishly. Are you with me today? Number three we're talking about. Number three today, meditate always, always on God's glory. Meditate always on God's glory. Glory, God's glory is God's manifested, or I have it like this. God's, uh, what did I put on there? You, you got the slide, or do I have to go back up and look at my notes? God's displayed. We don't use manifested very often anymore. So glory is God's displayed goodness. It's God's, it's made evident for us. The glory of God is his goodness on display. So meditate always on God's glory or on his displayed goodness for our lives, which means remember the good things that God has done for us. We we're lucky enough, most of us in this place, to be born into a, an amazing nation or to now live in an amazing nation that is blessed by the hand of God. Every day, you and I should live that statement that we always say, to count our blessings, when truly we can't even, they're outnumbered. Can't even gather the, the number of them. But see, we have to continually think of the goodness of God. And that serves as, uh, as a reminder to build our lives on the positive things of God and not focus on the troubles and on the hardships. Because what happened is, as we see in the Old Testament, the children of Israel began to focus on their own, began to focus on the negatives, began to focus on the trial. The Bible says we just saw it. Even though they had seen God's work in their lives, they still tested God. But if we always make it a point to meditate on God's Goodness, meditate means to give, to give thought, to give a, 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 a reckoning to to, to, to continually stir or mull around in our minds what God has done. Then we will see God in our lives. In Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, verse number 10, is a reminder to the children of Israel. God reminds the children of Israel in verse number six, or verse number 10 of the sixth chapter, he goes on and he says, so it shall be when the Lord your God, listen to this, because this is really, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. This is us. This is us today. When the Lord God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large, beautiful cities, which you didn't build, goes on to verse number 11, to live in houses full of good things, which you didn't fill, hewn out wells, which you didn't dig, vineyards and olive trees, which you didn't plant, and when you have eaten and you are full, verse number 12 says, then beware, then beware. When you're fat and rich and happy in life, that's time to beware of life. Why? Lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. We live in cities that we didn't build. We live in great establishments. We live in an amazing nation with resources. We don't live in a nation that might have one major resource but sand on top of it like the Middle East. We don't live in nations that have overwhelming jungles but it's hard to develop. We live in a nation from one side of the coast to the other side of the coast on, from, from sea to shining sea. We've got everything we need at hand. God has given us, this country, this nation, the most blessed nation in the world. Everything we need, cities that we didn't build, houses that we didn't fill, wells that we didn't dig, plants and vineyards that we didn't plant. And now he says, when you are full and happy, don't forget God. Don't forget God. We must never forget how many people have you and I met in our lives that come to God when their life is a wreck and as soon as God does the repair work, out, back to the way life is. That is the shot across the bow that Jesus is speaking that, listen, you cannot continue in that. I remember I met a guy. He was a, a, an acquaintance of mine. I knew him. And his life was in shambles. He had been dating a person for a really long time, and, he, and they, they, it just was on and off and on and off. And this person told me one time, he says, well, Miss Liz, we, they got back together, and he says, yeah, this guy, my boyfriend, he, 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 saw, he said he was going to start serving God. And like, we were like really cool. We were happy because we were praying for this guy. You know, we, we had known him and, uh, and, and things of that nature. And so I remember one day he was over at our house, and I was talking to him about his, his conversion. He says, man, what happened? I heard you're going to church now. I heard, you, I heard you're involved. I heard you're going to a small group. And, and he was sitting there and he says, yeah, you know, 
I figured I'd give it a try. I figured I'd give it a shot. I, I, it's pretty cool. And I says, well, I mean, surely you're, you're, you're experiencing the goodness of God. He says, you know, yeah, I, I, I'm just, I'm kind of playing it out. You know, things have been going well in my life. And so, you know, as long as it continues this way, I'll keep at it. And I asked him, I said, what happens if, if, if things don't go your way? And he says, well, I'll go back to Catholicism then. It was easy. They just told me what to do. They just told me how to do things. I didn't have to do anything. That was his attitude. Guess what? Two weeks later, his life went back to the same way. Why? Because we think that if we come to God, we get on our knees at church, that God's going to repair everything. And then when we do, we forget. But forgetting the goodness of God is fatal to our relationship with God. Fatal to our relationship. I was going to title this message, The Peril of Not Progressing, which is the substatement in the New King James Version Bible of Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse number one through nine talking about those who have heard and who have tasted and experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit and have turned away how it is impossible for them to come back. Why? Because when we have this attitude that I'll go to God, let God repair me, and then I will forget everything that God has done, it is fatal to our relationship. Fatal to our relationship. So you see, it's, this is something for us to take very serious in our lives. Last one for today. Last one for today. And this is my absolute favorite. This is where it really, really gets good. Last one for today, talking about moving forward. Teach the next generation God's goodness. We have got to be. Remember I said it's not over? I said it's not too late for America. It's not too late for the church as a whole. It's not too late to see revival. It's not, we are not so far gone into postmodernism, Christianity, into seeker-sensitive faith, into watered down. We are not so far gone. But what we have got to do is, as a church, as parents, as uncles, as aunts, as, as grandfathers, as grandmothers, as just dude down the road, whatever it might be, we have got to be future-minded to teach the next generation about God's goodness. Because if we don't, the world will teach them other things. The world will teach them other things. In parenting society, everything we do, if we don't teach them now, what they need to believe, they will be taught by someone else. In Judges, the second chapter. Judges, the second chapter, verse number 10, talking about the last moments of, uh, of Joshua and Joshua's life and the, the conquests of, of the children of Israel. Now Joshua and his generation have passed. Judges, in the second chapter, verse number 10, talking, uh, says this, and when that generation, Joshua, the conquest, those who had seen the goodness of God, the generation, the chosen ones to come into the promised land. When that generation had been gathered to their fathers, they died. Another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. And look what it says, verse number 11. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord because if we don't teach our children what to do, what to say, how to think, somebody else will. Then they did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them, listen to this, and they provoked the Lord to anger. It's not about me. It's not about you in your current life. It's about our children. It's about, you say, Pastor Luke, my children are grown out, out of the house. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't have kids. It's not even about our children. It's about our children's children. It's about our children's children's children. If the Lord tarries, we have got to teach the generations what they should know about the gospel. They may hate us for it. They may ridicule us for it. They may walk out on us for it. But let me tell you something. The Word of God says that the Word of God shall not return void. And I'll tell you what, my sister, my sister, myself, and my oldest sister, the four of us in our house, are walking proof that when you teach your children the things of God, God, they may despise you for it when they're teenagers, but they'll love you for it as adults. It's not the TV's job. It's not the school's job. It's not the children's ministry's job to teach our children. It's our job 
to look our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, our friends, our family members, whoever it might be that's younger than us. It's our job to look them in the eye, to tell them to put the phone down, to turn the TV off, and let me share with you God's goodness. Let me share with you what God has done for this family. Let me share with you what God will do for you. That's why the Bible says, train up a child in the way that they should go, and they will not depart from but you got to start training. It's not too late. Pastor, look, my kids are growing up out of the house. Look them in the eye and start teaching them what the Word of God says. My parents, all my life, biggest issue in America and church when it comes to parenting is sports. All my life, my parents told me, my dad, I used to despise him for it. No secret. I used to despise my father for it. But they would quote Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But dad, I got hockey practice. Dad, I got practice. Dad, I got a game. Dad, I got a tournament. Well, as long as it's on a church day, you don't. Man, I used to despise my parents for it. But you know what? Even in the, the younger years of my sports, when I didn't, when I missed practice and I got bumped to the third or the fourth or the pickup string and I never even got to play, God still blessed me in the sense that when I played sports, I was still the leading scorer on my team, even though I wasn't first string. And even now, what we teach our children, we begin to teach them that it's okay to skip out on Sunday. That it's okay to go to the river. It's okay to have a baseball turn. Pastor, look, if I don't get them in sports right now, they won't get into college. How about we trust God for something that God blesses? We get so wrapped up. We had such the wrong direction. They have to be professional athletes to, to make it in life. Let me tell you something. They don't. They have to serve God to make it in life. And we have got to make a stand that says, listen, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You can play sports, but you ain't going to play 15 of them. You can play sports, but you're not going to take every waking moment of this family's life because God will take every waking moment of this family's life. Don't be afraid. Fred, our administrator, always says, don't be scared to be afraid. Parents, they may not like you. Know, here's, the, here's the reality. Parents, they probably won't like you. As a child, talking experientially, I could not stand my parents for it. Couldn't wait. Man, I'm, I'm 18 years old. I'm out of here. Pe Jessica didn't even wait. <laughs> but here we're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not for ourselves. Not because I couldn't find another job. Not because this is, this is what I, I just, I guess I fell into it. We do this because there was a seed planted. There was a seed planted that does not return void. And we as a church, it's not too late for us. It's not too late for us as a nation. All these gun issues. All these campus shootings. The issue is we're not teaching our kids. We're letting the television teach them. And so the TV says, shoot your school. But if we as parents say, God says, forgive those that spit, spit on you. God says, if you get bullied, turn the other cheek. Someday, God has vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. If we teach our children what it's like to look like Christians as children, then as adults, they'll live it. But it starts now. Now, I know it's passion because I'm preaching to myself. I heard the cannon ball go across the deck as I read this scripture. And Jesus says, you heard you saw and you didn't turn. Woe to us, church in America. Woe to us in San Bernardino. Woe to us who hear, who see the goodness of God, that experience it and do nothing with it. Because there was somebody in the past that would have done something with it. But they didn't have that opportunity. We do. Let me leave you with this statement because I don't want to leave on a, on a negative. I want to leave on a positive. In John the 20th chapter, verse number 29. A direct exhortation to you and I, John 20, 29. Jesus says to Thomas, Thomas says to, to disciples, I'm not going to believe that Jesus rose from the dead until I stick my finger in his hands and my hand in his side. And Jesus appears in their midst. Thomas is like, whoa, whoa. Jesus says, hey man, put your hand on my finger, or put your finger on my side, or my, put your finger on my hand, and put your hand on my side. Thomas says, I believe. Jesus says to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Now he says to you and I, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Church, we weren't there, 
on resurrection. We weren't there to stick our fingers in the nail holes of Jesus' hands, to stick our hands in the side of Jesus. Here we are going on what we call faith. And Jesus says to you and I, blessed are those of us who have not seen him, yet we still believe. We are blessed. It's not too late. God can turn this country around. God can turn the status of the church globally around. He can turn the status of our family around. It's not too late, but it starts by making a choice. And he goes on in verse number 30, and he says, Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Why? That we may not see, but still believe. Verse number 31, that these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. Church, it's time for you and I. Oh, listen, if you don't get anything, it's time for me in my own life to move forward in the gospel of Jesus Christ, to reflect the glory, to make a decision, to follow after God to, to, to do all that I can to pronounce the glory and the goodness of God that those that might, are around me might see God in his goodness. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Hey, listen, I want to do one more thing. I want to just take a quick moment to, to give you the opportunity to examine your heart, to examine your life. You see, it'd be a shame for us to have services. It'd be a shame for me to, to teach a message like I taught tonight and to walk out of this place and assume that everybody is in the right place in the right position with God. So let me ask you an important question, and nobody's going to know the answer that you have except for you and God. So if you were to leave this place and you were to die, heaven forbid that'd be the case, but if your heart were to stop beating, what would happen to you after you died? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? It's a great question for us to examine ourselves. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. So why don't we, why don't we look at that? You know, you might say, oh, Pastor Luke, I never really thought about heaven or hell. I always thought that as, as some preacher's fantasy or, or something that man's made up to, to make us to be good as children. But let me tell you something. Just because you don't see it or because you don't feel it or because you haven't experienced it doesn't mean it's not real. Listen, you know full well that there are microwaves and radio waves going from me to the sound booth right now because you can hear the sound of my voice through this system. Yet, even still, you can't see and feel them or, 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 or experience them, but they're real. Heaven's a real place. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you believe. Heaven's a real place. Hell's a real place. Important enough for God to tell us about it. Important enough for the Bible to be preserved over thousands of years to teach us about it so that you and I can take it serious like we talked about today. Listen, you can't get to heaven based on your own devices. You can't get to heaven your way, some well-meaning church committee's way because your parents told you something or because you read it in a book somewhere that if you did this or you did that or if you were a good person. Nothing you and I could ever do in our own lives could ever make us good enough to get into heaven, which means that we can't hope, think, or want our way into heaven. We can't go to heaven because we sit in church even though you're here right now. You're not going to get into heaven because you volunteer in the children's ministry, the youth department, or sing in the choir. not going to get to heaven because you give to the Red Cross or, or because you wear Tom's shoes or because you gave to the, uh, the, the Haiti relief effort. It doesn't matter what you do as far as goodness. The Bible says that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. Nothing we could ever do would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. We say, well, Pastor Luke, I've always called myself a Christian. I've got a cross around my neck or I've got a, a scripture tattooed on my, on my body or a reminder uh, or something like that. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you've given yourself the title, because you call yourself a Christian, because you've got a cross or St. Christopher, because you have a marking on your body that says that, that you're a Christian means you're going to get into heaven. Nowhere are you going to find that. That's like calling myself a Dodger or, 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 or tattooing the, the Los Angeles logo on my, on my chest. Just because I did that does not make me a member of the Dodgers team. Neither does it make us a member of the kingdom of heaven. You see, the reality is, is that it's God's heaven. The only way we can get to God's heaven is God's way, and that is through Jesus. Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do this any other way but God's way today. And let me share with you that way. Jesus speaking to a man in the Bible, in the, in the book of John, in the third chapter. You can read it for yourself. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, a religious leader, a man who gave to the poor, a man who memorized Bible scriptures, a man who did all the right things, wore all the right clothes, said all the right things. Jesus says to Nicodemus, rather than patting him on the back when Nicodemus asks him, what must I do to get into heaven? Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does born again mean? Our society, our, 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 the media that we watch, Hollywood and, and sitcoms have made that out to be radical, crazy, weirdo Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, in the eyes of God and the heart of God, born again has always meant the same thing. Here it is, that you've given God all of your heart, that you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. 
It's not about your mental ascent towards God. It's not about your carnal knowledge of who God is. The Bible says the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. You already know who Jesus is. That's why you're here. It's not about that. God says, I want all of your heart. I want all of your life. Let me prove it to you. In the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to the church. People like you and I doing good, thinking that we're in the right place. And Jesus says to the church, he's coming back. And when he comes back, he better find us, the church, hot or cold. Because if he finds us lukewarm, Jesus says he will vomit us from his mouth. It's a shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected, counted as waste from the kingdom of God. What does lukewarm mean? Let's just define that real quick. Lukewarm means simply you're a little bit in, a little bit out. A little bit of, a little bit of God, a little bit of the world. Occasional church attendance, token prayer, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You're riding the fence. Lukewarm means that you're not wholehearted in the relationship with God. You know as well as I know that if you were to go to any relationship you ever had, whether it be family, children, wife, friends, business, whatever it might be, and you were to go to that person and say, you know what, I'm only going to give you a little bit of my relationship, a little bit of my effort. You know as well as I that that relationship would never succeed. Yet we think we can go before God and say, God, I'll give you an hour a month. I'll give you a service here. I'll give you a token scripture there. God says, I want all of your heart. I want all of your life. Well, so then how do we get to heaven? Well, we can't do it your way. Like I said, we can't do it my way today. Let's do it God's way. Jesus Christ said this. He said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him before men, he'll deny you before his father. So today I want to give you that opportunity. Here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go like this. I'm going to go one, two, and I'm going to count to three. I'm going to smack my head on my Bible. Three. Just like that. Real loud. And I want to give you the opportunity today to ensure your place with God, to leave the past behind, like we said, to change course, to hear the word of God, to see the goodness of God, and to make a change of course in your life. And here's what I'm going to do. When I smack my hand on my Bible, I'm going to offer you, the, give you the opportunity to change your life forever by giving God your heart, by giving God your life. And what I'm going to ask you to do and then I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, hey, Pastor Luke, today I want to make sure. Pastor Luke, today I, I, I want to give God my heart. I want to give him my life. Pastor Luke, today I want to make sure today that I get into heaven, that, I, that, I, that I'm in the right stand, standing with God. You see, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put your hand right back down right after that. I won't embarrass you. But even if you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? Let me encourage you, don't let a moment of irrational emotion, embarrassment stop you from making the very best decision you could ever make in your life. This is it. This is the pinnacle of human decision right here. To choose to serve God, to choose to live a life of, uh, in eternity with God in heaven. Leaving the old way behind and going forward in your relationship with God. You say, Pastor Luke, I, I, how do I know? Well, if you've never given your heart, you've never given your life, in just a moment, if that's you, pop your hand up. Maybe if you did this as a child in the youth group, but you never really followed through, or at a Harvest or Billy Graham crusade, but you never really followed through with that. We talked about that today. Maybe now it's time for you right now, today's your day to follow through, to make sure. Don't walk out of this place without making sure. Who should raise their hands? If you've been living lukewarm, we've been talking about it tonight, been playing games with God, been hearing, seeing the goodness of God, but doing your own thing. Listen, it's time now to make the decision to go forward in your relationship with God. Stop playing games with God. Don't go another moment. Today, get your hand up in just a moment. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put your hand right back down. And let's ensure your place with God for eternity, forever and ever. You see, God's not in heaven with a two-by-four waiting to whack you over the head. He's not a, a kid on an anthill with a magnifying glass trying to burn you up. God loved you so much that he gave Jesus Christ a beaten, bloody mess to walk the, the streets of Calvary, to walk the hill of Calvary, to die on a cross naked for the world to see for our sin and our shame so that we could give God our heart, so that we could give God, God our life. God gave his everything, and in return, he wants ours. The decision's yours. God's a free, it's a free will choice. He can't make you. He's not going to force his way or, or manipulate his way in. Simply put, God has given you. He loved you so much he gave you the free will choice. He's not in the business of condemning men to hell. He's in the business of redeeming men to heaven. But it's your and my choice today. So just in, in just a moment, I'm going to count to three all across this auditorium, wherever you're at. If that's you in this moment, if I'm talking to you, this is your moment. This is your time. Don't walk out of this place. Don't wait another moment. And let's, get, let's ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. Whether you're in the front rows, whether you're in the back row, hey, listen, you guys in the family room, I'm talking to you. If you're listening uh, in the, around the campus, you hear the sound of my voice, or you're watching on TV, or you're watching online, this is your moment. This is your time. Don't let another moment go by. I'm going to count to three all across this auditorium. If that's you, in a moment when I do, I want you to pop your hand up and be proud about it. 
this is the best decision you'll ever make. And I'll see your hand, I'll acknowledge it, you can put it right back down and then we'll change destinies together. The decision is yours. Here we go, I'm gonna count to three. This is your moment, this is your time. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see those hands in this place. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I see you guys right over there. Eight wise people. Anybody else on this, anybody on this side? Nine, I got you right there. Nine wise people. Anybody else in this place? Nine wise people. Where you at, number 10? Say, man, I wonder if I should. I want, ah, 10 wise people. Hallelujah. Hey, please, let's praise God for 10 wise people in the house this, this evening. Here's what we're going to do. I said I wanted, you said I want to do this by, by raising your hand. Now it's time for us to change destinies. Here, folks, here's what we're going to do. We're all going to stand. As we stand, if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, get out of the seat, get out of the aisle, come meet me here at the front. If you need a friend, bring a friend. If you brought somebody and they raise their hand, come get out of their seat, come with them. Meet me right here. We're going to change destinies right here, right now. This is your moment. This is your time. Come on, wherever you're at, the back row, the front row, this is your time. Come on, right up here. Come on, you can come. If that's you in this place, come on. Hey, right on, my man. Hey, great. Congratulations. Oh, I'll get you over here. Congratulations. Right over here. Awesome, awesome, awesome. If that's you in this place, come on. It's not too late for you. You can come. Right now is your time. This is your moment. This is your time. Yeah, they're still coming. We'll wait. Come on. Congratulations, my man. Here's what we're going to do. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to pray with you, okay? You're going to get some prayer. We're going to, you're going to accept Jesus Christ into your life. You're going to make him your Lord. You're going to make him Savior. He's going to give you some free literature, some free information. You're going to walk out of this place and say, what do I do? Where do I go? We're going to help point you in the right direction. Last thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends at The Rock. That Somebody that will meet with you before church, so sit down with you, buy a cup of coffee, teach you some things about the Word of God so that you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from right now, so that you get strong in the ways of God. And here's my challenge to you. Give this church, the Word of God, one year, 12 months to sit and to listen. I'm not asking you to join. I'm not asking you to sign a contract. I'm asking you to come and make a commitment to listen to the Word of God for 12 months. And I promise, if you do, your life will never be the same. And your expectations of what your life could be will be exceeded by God. I guarantee it. So if you guys just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.